Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Hydraulic Fracturing Analysis. That's presented by engineer Mustafa Zidan. I am Abdullah Abdurrahman, business developer in Reservoir Solutions Company. Thus, I would like to have a five-minute presentation about Reservoir Solutions and uh, the upcoming events that will be conducted into December. So, for the company profile, Reservoir Solutions is a company specialized in providing technical studies and courses for oil and gas companies and professionals. The company incorporates many professionals with diverse technical backgrounds related to oil and gas exploration and production. Our services include technical reservoir studies, field planning, reservoir static and dynamic. Planning. Our services include technical reservoir studies, field development planning, wait for that. Please mute your microphone. Our services include technical reservoir studies, planning, reservoir static and dynamic modeling, economic feasibility studies, technical support for academic researchers like PhD and master degrees. Also, we are assisting in writing technical papers and publishing. We are also supporting technical petroleum courses by industry experts. We are providing programs for two upcoming for our recent technical studies that we deliver. We deliver a reservoir static and dynamic modeling study for oil company in Libya, gas condensate field development plan preparing for a Turkish company, economic feasibility study for gas recycling project in Turkey, economic feasibility study for an offshore field in South America, and will test interpretation for a client in the USA. The recent petroleum courses that we delivered practical reservoir static dynamic modeling, coring and routine core analysis, routine core analysis, BVT of fundamentals and equation of state tuning, reservoir dynamic modeling using software, a special core analysis and reservoir engineering applications, integrated reservoir management. We have two upcoming courses that will be conducted into December. The first course will be the nodal analysis and artificial lift design. That course, in that course, you will learn how to do nodal analysis, how to select the suitable and the optimum artificial lift method for an oil and gas, uh, for an oil well. And also, we will have real cases for sucker root pumps, ASP pump gas lift, PCB, and jet pump. So you will learn how to design and deselect the systems for all these artificial lift methods. Okay, that is the first course that will start on 1 December, on the 1st of December. The second course will be the static and dynamic modeling. We will learn how to make your complete, your complete model static and dynamic from scratch data. We will start by the well logs data for the seismic interpretation outputs data, the faults and surfaces, and also the other outputs to make 3D, uh, 3D static model, uh, including structure modeling, trophysical modeling, fishings, fishes modeling. Then we will divert to the dynamic modeling that you will do history matching and prediction. Okay, all of that you will learn into that course. That will start on 15 December, 15th December, inshallah. If you decide to enroll the two courses, so you will have a discount about 10 USD in case that you decide to enroll into the two courses. I will send all the links for the two courses, the content for the two courses into the chat. For our, for our uh, two-day webinar, the instructor for our 2D webinar is engineer Mustafa Zidane. Engineer Mustafa Zidane is a production technology engineer at Papitko company in Egypt. 
with more than four years of experience in well intervention, completion, production optimization, and artificial intelligence technology. And mainly focusing in formation installation using hydrate fracturing techniques, conventional conductor foam, and methanol rack. So for the webinar rules, kindly ask your question into the Zoom chat. And also all that if you have any question, it will be sent by mail to our engineer and he will answer the mail. Mute your microphone and camera. In case that you wanted to have a certificate for attendance for that webinar, you can fill into the form that will be sent into the Zoom chat for some time. Join our Telegram, Telegram channel and follow our LinkedIn uh, page and the YouTube page for the upcoming webinars and courses. And the link also will be sent into the Zoom chat. Our mail and WhatsApp will be more than happy to receive your concerns. So thank you all and Engineer Mustafa, you can start our Uh, thank you, Abdullah, for your introduction and uh, welcome everybody to our session uh, about mini frac and divot analysis. Uh, let's first go quickly through today's agenda. We will start by an overview of the, the mini frac test and what data that can be obtained from mini fracs. Uh, then we will go through the step rate and calibration test analysis. And uh, after that, we will talk about the fracture closure identification methods. Uh, including the G function, the log log, and the square root method. Uh, then we will go a little bit in some details about the data obtained from a mini frac and how this data can uh, affect the design and execution uh, of our main fracture treatment. Afterwards, we'll go through uh, different methods of leak of control and how to select the best method for every uh, reservoir case. Then we will have a summary of different fracture propagation behaviors and how to identify and analysis every case. Uh, we will also talk uh, about step down test and near wheel bore frictions calculations. And finally, we'll talk about diagnostic fracture injection test and how to identify the different flow regimes after fracture closure. Uh, and we will see how to calculate the reservoir permeability and reservoir pressure uh, from a divot. Uh, so, uh, what's a mini frac or what's a data frac? Uh, a mini frac is simply a, a relatively short duration bumping period uh, of fracturing fluid into the formation, followed by a shut term period and a pressure decline analysis uh, period. Uh, during a mini frac, we use the same fluid uh, that we will be using for our main fracturing treatment and uh, uh, the reason why it's called uh, a mini frac or a data frac uh, is that because it's a, it's a short or small treatment uh, as we will be using small volume and bumping for short time. Uh, so it's uh, basically a, like a reduced or a mini frac treatment. We will also perform uh, mini fracs to, uh, to acquire some data about the reservoir and the fracturing fluid that will be helpful in designing uh, our main fracture treatment. Uh, and unlike main fracs, uh, mini fracs are performed without any probant uh, concentration. Uh, from a mini frac job, we can decide on what is the best bad volume for the main fracture treatment. And uh, we can also decide on either if our fracturing fluid is efficient uh, or not for the main treatment. And we will, uh, and if we will need any fluid loss additives for the main job or not. And what is the best pumping schedule for the main treatment. Uh, all these informations and more can be determined uh, after a mini frac test. Uh, so on a time scale, this is uh, how a mini frag job will look like compared to a main fracturing uh, treatment. Uh, before we go any farther, we need to confirm that mini frag is not a divot or mini frag is not a diagnostic fracture injection test. And we will be mentioning some uh, overview and some notes about divot analysis by the end of that session. Uh, so uh, this is uh, what a typical pressure response during a mini frag uh, or a defect will look like. Uh, we will start by uh, picking up the bump rate and the pressure will go up till uh, the formation breakdown if it's not already broken. 
uh, then we will have a, a stable fracture propagation uh, uh, propagation period and after that we will shut down our pumps and the pressure will fall off immediately to, to the ISIP or the instantaneous shut-in pressure and then after that our fluid will start to leak off from the formation or from the fracture walls uh, till the fracture completely uh, closes at some point uh, and uh, then after the fracture closure, the pressure will transient into the reservoir uh, following a, a linear flow uh, regime. Uh, then uh, at a later time, that pressure transient would follow a pseudo radial flow inside the reservoir. Uh, we can see uh, uh, two different or two separate regions for analysis, which are the before closure analysis and the after closure analysis. And we can perform dif different analyses from these two periods, as we will see shortly. Uh, so this is a, a summary of a detailed mini frag job. We would start by loading our hole with the fracturing fluid, uh, then uh, followed by an optional step rate test or step up test. And then we will keep the bump rate constant uh, for a short period of time to perform our calibration or fluid efficiency test. Uh, then we perform a hard shutdown followed by a fall off period for analysis. And then we can open the bumps again and start to perform a separate step down test. We will discuss every part of these stages in detail and see what data that can be collected from each stage uh, in the next slides. Uh, so uh, what, can, what can we get from a, a mini frag or from a data frag? Uh, first, from the pre-closure analysis, we can get an estimate of the formation closure pressure, which is equivalent to the minimum horizontal stress or the pressure at which the fracture starts to close. And then we can get the, the total and the near will pour frictions or what we call the entry frictions. Uh, and uh, also from a mini frag, we can calculate the fluid efficiency, the net pressure, the fracture gradient, and the leak of coefficient. Uh, more than that, we can calculate uh, and perform our calibration of stress data and calibrate our initial frag model or geomechanical uh, model. We can also identify non-ideal fracture propagations through our formation. Uh, then from uh, the after closure analysis, uh, which is usually done if you are performing a defect, we can get the reservoir pressure, the reservoir permeability, and again, we can confirm our closure pressure. Let's first start with a step rate test. And during a step rate test, we perform incremental increases of pump rate with very small increments till we get to the, the mini frag designed rate. For each step, we would record the, the pressure and the stabilized, the rate and the stabilized bottom hole pressure response. In this example, we have decided, uh, designed our mini frag on 30 barrels per minute. So we perform it before that uh, about seven step rates till we reach 30 barrel per minute and at each step we recorded the rate and the stabilized bottom hole pressure response. So the idea of a step rate test or a step up test is to get a relation between the pressure and the rate while pumping into the formation, then increasing the rate till we fracture the formation and get another relation of pressure and rate for the fracture propagation. If we eventually uh, draw the, the pressure and the rate on a Cartesian plot, we will get two different trends or two different lines. The first one would represent the fracturing fluid leaking into the formation, and the second one would represent the fracturing fluid creating and propagating the fracture inside the reservoir. In this example, we have a Cartesian plot of a step rate test, and the first line, which is in green here, represents the formation trend, which is the period when we pump it with very low rates without initiating uh, any fracture. And the red line or the second line represents the, the fracture propagation trend line, which shows that the fracture propagation after we increased the rate at very high rates, resulting in creating and propagating a fracture inside the formation. So uh, first from the, the intersection point of the two lines, we can get an estimate of the fracture propagation pressure and the fracture propagation rate. Uh, also intersection of the, the formation line with the Y axis would represent the value of the reservoir pressure and extrapolation of our fracture line uh, till it uh, intersects the Y axis at zero rate 
would give us an estimate of the the closure pressure or the minimum uh, horizontal stress. For this example, we got a, a fracture propagation pressure uh, of about uh, 2,800 psi and a fracture propagation rate of about 15 barrel per minute. Uh, and we got a, a closure stress of about 2,200 psi and a reservoir pressure value around uh, 500 psi. Uh, so for uh, a successful step rate test, you need to take care of uh, some points or some nodes. And uh, the first one, you need to have a minimum of three steps before the formation fracture and another three points or three rate steps after you fracture the formation. Uh, so you can get uh, correct straight lines representing the, the formation line or the formation trend line and the fracture trend line. The second note is that for a high permeability formation, we can uh, use large increments or large rate steps like three or four barrel per minute for each step rate. But for a low permeability formation, we need to use very small increments like uh, half or one barrel per minute, uh, or we will end up breaking the formation during the first two uh, or three steps. Uh, also, you need to wait for each rate step till the pressure response finally stabilizes before you can go to uh, your next rate step. And uh, as mentioned before, the data that can be collected from uh, a step rate test or a step up test are the extension pressure, the extension rate, reservoir pressure, and formation uh, fracture closure pressure. Uh, so most people now don't really depend on the values obtained from a step rate test uh, because uh, as you increase the rate more and more, you will open more and more perforations uh, in the well pore. And uh, when more perforations open, this means that the perforation efficiency will increase and that perforation breakdown uh, will end up masking your fracture extend, uh, extension pressure, which means that for each rate step, you will get a different relation between the rate and the pressure depending on the number of perforations that are opened and uh, depending on the new rate step. So estimating the extension pressure from uh, a step rate test would be uh, eventually misleading. Uh, also, as Barry reported that for most reservoirs, uh, even high permeability ones, the formation will eventually break down uh, even uh, at very small rates like one or five uh, barrel per minute. Uh, Barry used the, the Darcy equation to calculate the extension rate by using delta B or delta pressure inside the equation, which is equal to the fracture extension pressure or the fraction, the fracture uh, pressure minus the reservoir pressure. And by using other reasonable parameters in this equation, you will get a relationship between the permeability and the extension rate. Uh, that would look like uh, something like this plot here. And uh, we can see that for even high permeability systems, it can take uh, very small rates like one or five barrel per minute to uh, initiate and propagate a fracture inside your reservoir. So we finished the step rate test. We picked up the rate to a high value, and then we will start our calibration test or so-called fluid efficiency test. And calibration test is simply a, a short and a constant rate pumping followed by a shut-in uh, and decline time period. A calibration test or a fluid efficiency test is generally done to, to propagate a frac and to get an idea of uh, what will happen uh, during the main fracture treatment and obtain some data from the main fracture treatment uh, obtain some data for the main fracture treatment, as we will see. So the first thing that we can get from uh, the mini frag is the ISIP, or uh, which refers to the, the instantaneous shut-in pressure. Uh, this pressure value indicates uh, the pressure inside the, the frag at which the frag was propagating and growing. We can get the ISIP value by extrapolating the straight line pressure fall of trend, which is in red here, till it intersects the first rise of water hammer after we shut down the pumps. Sometimes when, when this straight line is not very evident or not very clear, it may help to, to draw the, the time uh, on a log scale uh, so you can pick the right straight line or the right, uh, the right extrapolation uh, line. 
so the, the difference between the, the end of job stable fracture propagation pressure and that ISIB would end up giving us uh, an estimation of the, the total frictions uh, of the wheel bore. The total frictions would include the the tubing friction component, the perforation friction component, and the near wheel bore or tortuosity frictions, which is uh, the frictions of the fluid as it leaves the, the perforation tunnels and move in tortoise path around the, the wheel bore till it reaches uh, to the, the fracture plane. We'll talk about these friction components in detail if we have time to go through the, the step down test analysis uh, soon. Uh, fracture propagation gradient can be calculated from the bottom hole ISIB value, which is equal to the, the surface ISIB plus the hydrostatic pressure till the perforation. And fracture propagation gradient would equal uh, the, the bottom hole ISIB value divided by the TBD till the mid perforation. And uh, obviously it's a, a pressure gradient in BSI per foot. Uh, so calibration test is then followed by a, a shut-in period and uh, then monitoring the, the pressure decline after this shut-in period is used to detect uh, when the fracture closes, which refers to the fracture closure time and the pressure at the closure time, which is the closure uh, pressure. Then from this closure time and then from the, from the closure time and the bumping time together, we can calculate the fluid efficiency and the required bad volume for the main fracture treatment. So decline analysis uh, includes recording and monitoring the, the bottom hole pressure decline after shutting to detect the fracture closure pressure. Uh, and detecting the fracture closure pressure from the, the decline analysis depends mainly on the fact that uh, the fluid will leak into the formation uh, in two different ways. The first way when the frag is still open and then it will leak uh, and it follow uh, another trend uh, when the fracture uh, closed. Uh, but monitoring the, the pressure response itself and the change in the bottom hole pressure may not be enough to detect the right closure point. So we use some diagnostic plots that can give us clear evidence or uh, more uh, more clearer evidence uh, of the fracture closure. These methods include, or these diagnostic plots include the, the G function plot and the square root method and the log log method. Uh, G function is generally a, a dimensionless time function that relates the shut in time and the bumping time. The first line of equation here shows a dimensionless time function, which is uh, equal to the, the shut in time minus the bumping time, all divided by the bumping time. Then, if you look uh, to the, the two other lines here, they show the, the steps of calculating the G function depending on that uh, dimensionless time function. Uh, so G function is calculated uh, after shutting for each time step and uh, two, two diagnostic plots can be generated and can be used to confirm the closure. Uh, the first one is the derivative pressure or what we call the, the, the first derivative, which is the derivative uh, of pressure with respect to uh, the G function. And the second one uh, is what we call the semi-log derivative, and it equals to the G function multiplied by uh, the first uh, derivative. Uh, from the G function equation, you can see that uh, this semi-log derivative uh, would uh, equal zero at the moment of shutting, uh, or at the moment where the shutting time equals the bumping time. And uh, also for, for a contained fracture uh, in a uniform isotropic formation, the leak of along the fracture should uh, be constant till the fracture eventually close. So the, this fact implies that the, the pressure derivative or the first uh, derivative of pressure with respect to the G function would be constant uh, during the fracture closure, uh, clo during the fracture closure, and uh, and the semi-log derivative would eventually follow a, a straight line passing through the origin uh, during the the fracture closure. Uh, so, if you want to identify the the fracture closure event or the fracture closure point, uh, we can identify it by uh, a plateau region on the first derivative or the end of the plateau region on the first uh, derivative and the deviation of the second or the semi-log derivative from a straight uh, line. Uh, the other method that can be used to confirm the closure is the square root method. And in this method, 
uh, we draw the, the bottom hole pressure response uh, against the, the square root of time uh, after shutting. And uh, like the G function method, we draw the first derivative pressure uh, with respect to the square root of time, uh, which is uh, the green solid line uh, in that chart. And then we draw the, the semi-log derivative, which is uh, the, the first derivative multiplied by the square root of time, and uh, it's the red curve uh, on that chart. And closure uh, can be identified by uh, first an inflection point of the first derivative curve uh, and uh, along with an inflection or deviation uh, of the, the, the second or the semi-log derivative from a straight uh, line. So for this example, our correct closure would be this point here against the inflection of the first derivative. The third method that uh, can be used to give uh, the closure pressure or estimate the, the closure pressure uh, is the log-log plot. And the uh, log-log plot is uh, basically a, a plot of delta pressure versus delta time on a log-log scale. Uh, this log-log plot can uh, mark the closure and identify the different flow regimes before uh, and after the fracture closure. And what we mean by delta P or delta pressure is the difference between the ISIB value and the bottom hole pressure response after shutting. And uh, delta time is equal to uh, the difference between the, the time uh, minus the ISIB time or the shutting uh, time. Uh, the delta B curve, which is the green line, and the semi-log derivative curve, which is the red line, both fall on a straight parallel line just uh, before the closure. Uh, that straight line would mostly be uh, a positive half slope uh, indicating uh, a linear flow regime inside the, the frag. Uh, and the closure can be marked by the end of that straight line on the semi-log derivative. Uh, we will also get back to this log-log uh, plot again and use it for flow regime identification after the fracture closure uh, when we discuss the after closure analysis. But for now, we will use it only for uh, a confirmation method uh, for our closure. So our closure in this example will be this point of uh, deviation or inflection point from a straight line. This is an example of a G function plot, and uh, we have here a, a plateau region on the first derivative plot. Uh, and uh, on the semi-log function or the semi-log derivative, we almost have a straight line before the inflection point that marks the, the closure. So if we want to, to pick a closure for this example, we will use uh, this point indicated by the, the, very, the vertical black line. Uh, if we draw or use the, the, the square root method or the square root plot for the, the same example, we can see that fracture closure is identified by an inflection point on the first derivative, which also uh, mar uh, was marked by uh, the, the deviation point or the deviation from a straight line uh, on the second derivative plot. If we use the third method or the log-log uh, plot, uh, we can see that the closure is evident on the semi-log uh, plot uh, derivative as it deviates from a straight line uh, or a positive slope line. Uh, and uh, in this example, the, the, the three methods uh, were used together to arrive to a consistent interpretation of fracture closure, which was around uh, 5,300 PSI for that example. Uh, after we calculated the, the, the fracture closure, uh, we can now get a value of the net pressure. And uh, a net pressure is defined as the amount of uh, over pressure we are applying above our minimum horizontal stress. So the, the net pressure would equal to the ISIP or the pressure inside the frac minus the closure or the minimum horizontal stress. For example, it says that uh, we have a minimum horizontal stress of 2,000 PSI and our ISIB was recorded to be 3,000 PSI. This means that we were applying about 1,000 PSI net pressure or over pressure above the, the minimum horizontal stress, which equals to 3,000 and minus the 2,000 minimum horizontal stress. The net pressure 
or the created fracture width is usually directed uh, proportionally directed to uh, proportionally directly proportional to the, the amount of net pressure we were applying on the formation. Uh, if we looked at this first example, we can see that there is a sm small amount of net pressure uh, value uh, that would result in a small created fracture width. But for the same formation, if we applied of, uh, or if we uh, applied more pressure or we increased the, the amount of net pressure value, uh, that would result in a much wider and much larger uh, fracture. Uh, a narrow fracture would eventually result in, in limiting the, the maximum probe and concentration that can be uh, bumped down the formation during uh, a main fracture treatment. Uh, another parameter that can be calculated from a mini frag is the fluid efficiency. And the fluid efficiency is defined as the ratio of the, uh, the stored fluid volume uh, within the fracture to the total injected fluid volume. And fluid efficiency represents the, the percentage of the injected fluid that's effectively uh, used to create and propagate uh, a frag. Uh, a fluid efficiency value can be estimated from the, the G closure value, which is the, the G function, uh, the G function value uh, at the fracture closure time. So if this vertical solid line represents the closure point, uh, the G closure would be the G function value uh, at this point on the X axis. Uh, so uh, what does it mean if we have high uh, fluid efficiency value? If we have high fluid efficiency, that means that there is a, a low leak of, of our fluid inside the, the formation, and that uh, would indicate that our fluid is efficiently used uh, to uh, create and grow uh, a fracture inside the formation. To have a better understanding of what fluid efficiency means, it says that we, we have uh, injected a total fluid volume of 100 barrels inside the formation. And uh, about 50 barrels of this fluid leaked inside the formation. The other 50 barrels uh, stayed or created uh, a frag. Uh, in, in this example, our fluid efficiency will be 50%, which is uh, the 50 barrels that stayed inside the frag and created uh, a frag divided by the total amount of the uh, injected uh, fluid. So uh, what if we measure a, a low fluid efficiency value and what does it mean? Uh, if we measured a low fluid efficiency value, uh, this means that we have high leak off inside the formation and a smaller amount of fluid volume staying inside the frac or propagating a frac and eventually we will have a, a smaller fracture geometry uh, that will be created and we will have a high possibility of screen out uh, if we try to, to place a large amount of probant using the same fracturing fluid that we used for uh, our mini frac. Uh, on the other hand, if we, if we have high fluid efficiency value, this means the opposite is true. And we have uh, less fluid leaking inside the formation, larger fluid volume creating and propagating a frac or staying inside the frac. And we have a larger fracture geometry created compared to the original uh, case. Another parameter that can be calculated from a G function plot is the leak of coefficient. And leak of coefficient uh, is, the, is the measure of the amount of fluid leaking over a specific area for a specific time. Uh, and the leak of coefficient is a very important parameter that is used for fracture uh, geometry calculations uh, uh, inside fracture simulation software. Leak of coefficient can be calculated from the plateau value uh, of the first derivative uh, from a G function plot. This plateau value shows uh, the pressure drop during the, the fracture closure uh, process. And this plateau uh, value or uh, this plateau pressure derivative value uh, along with the, the fracture height and the bumping time uh, can be used to uh, calculate our leak of uh, coefficient. Uh, so what if we observe it, uh, a low fluid efficiency uh, or a high fluid leak off after a mini frag? Uh, one of the following uh, methods can be used to reduce the leak off uh, during the main fracturing treatment. The first method is using uh, a sand slug. And uh, other methods can include uh, increasing the gel loading, adding an immiscible phase like diesel or nitrogen to uh, our main fracturing fluid. Uh, and uh, the last one that we will be discussing here is using fluid loss uh, additives. Uh, 
Generally, selection of the best method would uh, depend on the, the formation, permeability, and the existence of natural fractures inside our reservoir, as we will see and discuss shortly. So our first method to control uh, high leak off is using sand slugs. Uh, and uh, what, uh, what sand slugs are, they are generally a small diameter sand, which is usually 100 mesh or 200 mesh size that are pumped ahead of our main uh, proband size and usually bump it during the, the, the middle or by the end of the bad uh, stage. Uh, this is how a 100 mesh sand slug looks like compared to the normal proband sizes that are used for the main fracturing uh, treatment. And this is a, a snap uh, from the main treatment schedule uh, where they observed a high leak off during a mini frag and decided to uh, bump some volume of 100 mesh before they proceed with the main proband of uh, uh, 1630, uh, 1630 mesh. Uh, they used about, in this uh, job, they used about uh, 4,500 pounds of sand slug before uh, introducing uh, the main proband or the, uh, the main treatment schedule. So what uh, what this sand slug will will eventually do is that it will just go to the higher leak off areas which are normally natural fractures and fissures and will block them. Uh, when they block these areas, they would uh, reduce the leak off area before introducing our main proband or our later stage in the treatment design. Uh, so for the next stage. The fluid and the proband would go to uh, the main by wing frac instead of going to this leak of areas. Uh, sand slug are, are really one of the most effective ways uh, to reduce leak of in naturally fractured reservoirs. And uh, this chart shows an output of an experiment that was uh, done on a, on a large sandstone uh, rock sample which contained uh, natural fractures uh, of about uh, 10 or uh, 10 to 20 microns uh, fracture width. Uh, the y axis uh, shows the amount of fluid lost or the, the leaking fluid uh, over the time uh, on the x axis. And after bombing in this experiment or in this chart, after bombing a specific type of linear gel through our fractured uh, rock sample, the yellow line shows uh, the amount of fracturing fluid lost over time, which refers to the, the leak of uh, value. And uh, the red line uh, shows the same experiment, but done after bombing about 100 uh, mesh sand ahead of the, the same fluid. And uh, we can see that there is a great reduction in the total uh, volume of the fluid lost compared to the first time, which shows an enhancement or a reduction in the leak of value after using 100 mesh or what we call sand slug. The second method of controlling the leak of is increasing the gel load. And uh, gel loading, is defined as uh, the amount of gel added to a specific volume of uh, fracturing fluid. And it's usually measured, uh, uh, measured with thousands of gallons of, uh, with pounds of gel uh, added per thousand of gallons of the fracture uh, fluid. Increasing the gel loading results in increasing the viscosity. And this chart is just for illustration, but you can see that uh, the increase in the fluid viscosity as we add more and more gelling agent to the fluid system, increasing our uh, gel loading. Uh, also from this equation, we can see that Increasing the fluid viscosity by adding more gel or introducing more gel into our fluid system would result in a reduction in the leak of uh, coefficient. Uh, another thing that the gel loading does is that it, increase, it increases the, the filter cake thickness that is formed uh, on the fracture area or on the fracture face, and therefore reducing the, the leak of coefficient or reducing the, the fluid uh, that will leak inside the formation for later uh, stage or later uh, fluid. Uh, this is another example that was done on a, a specific uh, sandstone core uh, of permeability uh, about 0.1 milli Darcy. Uh, and uh, it was done to study the, the effect of increasing the, the gel loading uh, on the leak of uh, coefficient. And you can see that uh, there is a continuous uh, decline in the leak of coefficient with further increase or further adding of gel or further increase in the gel uh, loading. 
Uh, another method of controlling a uh, high leak off is adding an immiscible phase to a water-based fracturing fluid. Uh, this immiscible phase uh, can be diesel, oil, or gas such as uh, nitrogen. And uh, adding nitrogen to, to a water-based fracturing fluid will result in what we call a foam frac fluid. And foams are excellent leak of control uh, fluid uh, additives, especially for low permeability formation, uh, which generally has uh, a permeability less than 5 milli Darcy. Uh, so uh, this plot shows another experiment, but uh, done on a low permeability core sample uh, of about 0.1 milli Darcy permeability. And it shows uh, the reduction uh, in the lost volume uh, as we increase uh, the nitrogen percent and going from zero uh, nitrogen percent up to 20, uh, then 20 percent uh, of the fracturing fluid. And this experiment shows that the, the leak of uh, coefficient or the leak of can be minimized by using uh, nitrogen as an immiscible phase uh, inside our frac fluid. Uh, the last one or the, four method, the fourth method that we will discuss is adding fluid loss uh, additive materials. And adding fluid loss uh, additive materials can be a very effective uh, method for leak of control in high permeability and naturally fractured uh, reservoirs. Uh, this is the same experiment done before on a large sandstone rock sample which showed uh, a reduction in the leak of after we added uh, the 100 mesh, but this time the experiment was done again by pumping a, a small amount of silica flour uh, as a fluid loss additive before pumping our main fluid. And we can see that the, uh, even though the, the amount of silica flour is smaller uh, this time, uh, it resulted in even a, a greater reduction or a more further reduction uh, in the volume lost or in the leaking uh, volume. Uh, for, so let's talk about uh, non-ideal fracture behavior and uh, four different behaviors can be identified from our G-function uh, plot. Uh, this behavior includes uh, the normal leak off uh, behavior, the pressure dependent leak off or what we call uh, accelerated uh, leak off uh, and uh, delayed leak off which can be explained by both uh, a transverse storage theory or a, a fracture height recession. And the last behavior is the, the, the fracture uh, tip extension. For a normal leak off, uh, it happens when, when a fracture area is being constant during the shut-in and the leak off happens through a, a constant permeability and homogeneous rock matrix. And uh, we can see that uh, there are two characteristics that are visible on the G function curve during a normal leak off. The first one is that we will have a constant pressure derivative or a constant delta B over delta G during the, the fracture closure. And the second one or the second characteristic is that our semi-log derivative uh, lies on a, on a straight line that passes through uh, the, the origin point uh, uh, till the fracture uh, completely closes. Uh, the second behavior is the, the pressure dependent leak off or the BDL. The BDL indicates existence of natural fractures and fissures intersecting our main fracture. And BDL can be identified on the G function by a characteristic hump on the semi-log derivative that lies above the, 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 the straight line fitting through the normal leak of data. This hump indicates that our fluid is being leaking off faster than expect, expected from a, a by wing or for a normal uh, by wing fracture. Uh, this accelerated uh, leak off happens because uh, the natural fractures and fissures are providing uh, a larger surface area or more surface area which we call a secondary leak of area uh, along which the, the fluid can leak faster than normal. Uh, this is an example of uh, a BDL behavior. We have uh, here a, a hump that shows the, the fissures leak off followed by uh, a straight line that show uh, a normal leak off from a fracture uh, walls and uh, the, the first intersection uh, of the semi-log derivative uh, with the straight line marking the fissures closing pressure and the inflection point or the second intersection marks our fracture closure, which was confirmed also by uh, a plateau or by the end of the plateau uh, on the, the first derivative. Uh, the third behavior we have 
uh, or we may face during a, a main frag is a delayed leak off. And during a, a delayed leak off, the semi log derivative would fall uh, below the straight line that extrapolates through the, the normal leak off. Uh, data and uh, it will uh, form what we call uh, a characteristic pili below that straight line. This pili indicates that uh, our fluid is leaking uh, off slower than expected uh, from uh, a normal bi wing fracture, and uh, it suggests that uh, uh, our fracture has somehow a, another pressure support source, uh, as uh, we will see. Uh, so there are two two scenarios that can be used to explain uh, what's happening during a, a delayed leak of mechanism. Uh, the first one is that uh, the transverse storage mechanism, uh, and what we mean by transverse storage is that our main frac intercepts a, a secondary fracture network. Uh, a secondary fracture network, and uh, this fracture network is under higher horizontal stress uh, than the main frac, so it would close faster uh, than our main frac, pushing or supporting the fluid back into the main frac, uh, which would delay uh, our leak off uh, or delay uh, our closure. Uh, the second mechanism or the second scenario is what we call the height recession. And the height recession happens when, when our main frac propagates into uh, another low permeability and higher stress zone. Uh, and again, when, when this fracture closes back at this higher stress zone, it will push the fluid back uh, inside our main frac, uh, resulting in delaying our leak off or resulting in pressure support to our main uh, bi wing fracture. Uh, this is an example of uh, the, the storage mechanism showing the G function plot, and here is the characteristic pili uh, on the semi-log uh, derivative, indicating a, a delayed leak of mechanism. And finally, the fissures closed and the inflection point uh, indicates the, the main fracture closure uh, point, which was the end of the plateau, the small plateau region here on the, on the first derivative. The last behavior can, that can be evident on a G function plot uh, is the tip extension. And this behavior is uh, most likely to happen in a low permeability reservoir. Uh, and what really happens during tip extension uh, is that the, the pressure declines and the fracture width decreases. And when the fracture width decreases, the closing of the frac displaces more fluid to the fracture tip and causing propagation and more extension of the fracture tip even after we shut in uh, our pump. Uh, the semi log derivative uh, on a G function won't really follow any straight line in this case, uh, and we cannot pick up the closure or our fracture didn't uh, close, uh, and we cannot perform after closure uh, analysis for a tip extension. Uh, this is an example of a tip extension case where the semi log derivative continues to increase, and the first, uh, the first derivative is almost constant, and in that case, as we said, our fracture didn't close. Uh, so uh, a step down test, uh, what is a step down test? A step down test uh, is a test that can be performed if we faced high near will pour frictions or high uh, near will pour restrictions uh, during a mini frag job. And step down test uh, is usually performed to calculate the perforation and the tortuosity frictions and identify the, the main uh, the main or the major contributing component to uh, high frictions. Uh, as we mentioned before, the, the total frictions, uh, including the tubing frictions, uh, can be calculated from a mini frag uh, from the difference between the dynamic uh, and the static status or uh, the difference between the, the end of job uh, stable service pressure and our service uh, ISIB. Uh, the first step in estimating uh, the near will pour friction is calculating uh, the, the tubing friction or subtracting the, the tubing friction from the total friction equation. And we can calculate the, the, the tubing friction from correlations that are done for non-Newtonian fluids uh, or fracture fluids uh, or from the, the fracture fluid libraries and tests and experiments done uh, for each service company and for each specific uh, fracturing fluid. Subtracting the tubing friction from the total friction value would give us uh, the value of the total uh, near will pour friction, which we call the perforation and the tortuosity uh, friction. Uh, 
Uh, usually, if the if the remaining value of the near wheel board friction is higher than the than one thousand and five hundred psi, this value is uh, usually considered high, uh, and we need to perform a step down test to uh, isolate or to determine the, the dominant friction uh, component between them. Uh, it was found that uh, the perforation friction is directly proportional to the, the square uh, of the bumping rate multiplied by a constant called k perf, uh, and uh, the tortuosity frictions uh, are directly proportional to uh, a constant multiplied by the bumping rate uh, power to uh, a factor called beta, and uh, this factor was generally found to be uh, usually uh, less than one. Uh, so the, the total near wheel bore frictions component will look like that, and we we can see that there are three uh, unknowns in this equation. And in order to to solve this equation, we will need uh, at least three uh, recorded points of uh, rate uh, and the pressure drop. So we can uh, substitute in these three equations and calculate our friction parameters, which are k perf, k tortuosity, and beta factor. Uh, so uh, we can get these three rate points or the three steps by performing what we called a, a step down test or a, a step rate test and record the, the stabilized pressure against each rate point uh, the same way that we did in uh, in our step, step rate test. And by drawing the relation between this rate and the pressure drop uh, on a Cartesian plot and performing a best match for this relation, we can give uh, we can get an estimation of our three friction uh, parameters by solving the, the three uh, friction uh, equations that we show, and we can get estimate uh, of the values of these friction parameters. Then we can use these uh, values uh, of friction parameters to divide divide our friction component into uh, perforation component and tortuosity component and decide on uh, the main or the dominant uh, friction component. Uh, this was actually a, a quick overview of the step down test and we can make a, a whole separate session uh, for the step down test practice and analysis later. Uh, let's now move on uh, to the after closure analysis. Uh, as we mentioned, our pressure fall off uh, and uh, identify uh, uh, we, we perform it uh, a pressure fall off and we identify the closure using uh, uh, our diagnostic plots and we now are, are waiting for for a pseudo radial flow inside the formation. Uh, we will see quickly how we can confirm uh, a pseudo radial flow after closure. But uh, let's say that our target from the, the after closure analysis is to estimate or calculate the, the reservoir pressure uh, and reservoir uh, permeability. In order to perform uh, an after closure analysis, we have to perform what we call a DFID. Uh, which is uh, a diagnostic fracture injection test, and DFID is simply pumping uh, clean fluid, clean non-wool build, uh, non uh, building fluid inside uh, our formation, initiating a fracture like we did in the mini frac, and this clean fluid will eventually uh, leak off so quickly, and the transient pressure wave uh, would be induced inside our reservoir and then monitoring the, the, the pressure transient inside the reservoir can help us to uh, identify the, the reservoir pressure uh, and reservoir permeability. So clean and simple fluid should be used for DFID, uh, like treated water, and we pump with high stable rate, and for a short time, then we perform a hard shutdown. These are the procedures for a step down test. And uh, then after we perform, we monitor the fall off. We detect the closure like we did in like we did in many fracs, and then monitor the, the pressure uh, decline even further and identify our pseudo radial flow regime. Uh, and this table shows uh, a typical defect bombing stage uh, where we pumped almost 25 barrels uh, of KCL prime uh, with a pumping rate of about eight barrel per minute, uh, and then we perform it shutdown uh, for uh, analysis. So uh, after closure, the, the pressure will decay back into a formation dominated flow and possibly going through a, a formation pseudo linear flow regime and finally into a, a, a pseudo radial flow regime. Uh, these flow regimes uh, allow us to, to determine the, the, the reservoir pressure and permeability. So at the closure, 
a linear flow period can continue for some time depending on the reservoir permeability and the stored volume inside our frag and then at a late time this pressure transient established around the, the frag propagates further into the reservoir uh, and the transition into elliptical uh, then pseudo radial uh, flow so uh, as we mentioned before the different flow regimes can be identified from a log log plot uh, which uh, a log a log plot of delta b uh, versus a log plot of uh, or a log scale of delta t uh, and uh, we call this plot the boarded derivative or the boarded derivative uh, and on the boarded derivative or the log log derivative uh, the formation linear flow uh, will show as a, a negative half slope uh, after the fracture close, uh, closes uh, and uh, the, the formation radial flow uh, or a, a negative one slope following this linear flow would indicate uh, that we reach it uh, or our pressure response reach it uh, 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 tr transient into uh, a formation pseudo uh, radial flow. Uh, just a note here that in low permeability formation, uh, it can take several hours or days till we reach uh, our pseudo radial flow. Uh, but in high permeability formation, this pressure uh, transit can develop a pseudo radial flow immediately uh, after uh, closure. Uh, if we uh, if we confirm it, the, the formation pseudo uh, radial flow on a board derivative by a negative uh, one slope, we can mark the, the begin uh, of this radial flow period and use uh, this interval to calculate the, the reservoir pressure uh, and reservoir uh, permeability. Uh, so uh, we can we can use this formation radial flow period to perform the, our our after closure analysis or to estimate the, the reservoir pressure uh, using two methods. The first one is the Horner plot method, uh, and in Horner plot we draw the, the bottom hole pressure response. Uh, starting from the, the point of closure till the last recorded pressure point against a Horner time uh, on a Cartesian plot. And Horner time is equal to the, the bumping time plus the shot in time all divided by the shot in time. Uh, and from this Horner equation, uh, you can see that if we extrapolated the, 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 the reservoir or the bottom hole uh, pressure response till we reach Horner time of one, this means that we are extrapolating the, the pressure response uh, till an infinite uh, shot in time. And by this infinite shot in time, uh, our pressure response would eventually reach the, the reservoir pressure value. So intersection of the, the bottom hole pressure value uh, with Horner time uh, equals one would give us a value of the reservoir uh, pressure. Uh, also, the, the slope of this uh, straight line uh, portion through the, the radial flow period, uh, which we call, the, the, we call this slope the, the Horner slope, uh, or MH, uh, this slope can be used to estimate the, the reservoir uh, permeability from this equation. And we can see that the, the Horner slope or MH is uh, the function of Q, which is the bumping rate in parallel per minute that we were using during a, a diffit, and mu is the far field fluid viscosity. So if this is an oil well, uh, we will use the, the, the oil viscosity at the reservoir temperature, and H is the net bay thickness in foot. Uh, and uh, from all these uh, known parameters, uh, if you substitute it in this equation, you can get the value of the reservoir permeability uh, from Horner slope uh, in uh, Millie Darcy. Uh, the second method that can be used to identify the reservoir properties is by using what we call a, a radial flow time function or FR. And a radial flow time function is an equation or a, fu a function in, in the closure time and the shut in time. And uh, by the same way, uh, we use the Horner plot uh, for this method, we will draw the, the bottom hole pressure response uh, against the radial flow time function uh, on a Cartesian plot. And the radial flow uh, period uh, will show as a, a straight line uh, on this chart. And extrapolating this straight line to FR or, F, uh, or radial flow function of zero will uh, give us an estimation uh, of the reservoir pressure the same way we did in the Horner plot and uh, also the this slope uh, of the, the, the straight line uh, which we call the, the radial flow slope or M radial uh, is again characteristic and can be used to get the reservoir permeability from this equation where 
VI is the total injected fluid volume uh, during uh, defit in, barrel, in barrels, uh, and the mu again is the far field fluid viscosity, uh, and H is the net bay thickness, uh, and T sub C is the closure time. Uh, MR or uh, M sub R uh, is the radial flow uh, slope through this straight line portion uh, and if we rearrange the equation we can get the permeability in milli darcy from that slope uh, by using uh, this known parameters and uh, this equation uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier that in a low permeability formation uh, we can only observe a, a linear flow period which is uh, indicated by a negative half slope uh, on the boarded derivative or on the log log derivative uh, and we can depend on that linear flow period to estimate uh, our reservoir pressure uh, with a high accuracy as we will see. To estimate the reservoir pressure from only linear flow period uh, or, or to perform an after closure analysis from a linear flow period, uh, we will draw uh, uh, the bottom hole pressure again starting from the, the closure pressure against uh, this time what we call a linear flow time function and linear flow time function is also uh, another function of uh, closure time related to uh, the shut-in time. Uh, it's been uh, also reported that extrapolating that straight line portion uh, of pressure decline over the linear flow time period that we identified from the boarded derivative uh, can, guess, uh, can give us an, an accurate estimation of the reservoir pressure uh, when it intersects a linear flow function of zero. So we would extrapolate that straight line uh, over the linear flow time period and uh, we would extrapolate it to a zero linear flow time function and we would get an estimation of the reservoir pressure. But uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, g give an accurate estimate of the reservoir permeability depending only on the uh, linear flow uh, time period. Uh, this is an example of a defect that was done on an oil well, uh, which had an expected reservoir pressure of uh, 6,200 psi, uh, and we monitored the pressure decline on a log-log plot, uh, and we uh, identified the closure, as we mentioned, uh, at this point from the semi-log derivative. And then we identified a, a negative uh, half slope or we detected a negative half slope uh, post fracture closure that uh, uh, indicated the formation linear flow behavior. Uh, and then we also indicated uh, a negative one slope uh, on the board derivative, uh, which showed that both uh, the pseudo linear flow and pseudo radial flow uh, were reached uh, in this case. So uh, first we will use the linear flow analysis to estimate uh, the, our reservoir pressure. Uh, and as we mentioned, we draw the bottom hole pressure on a Cartesian plot uh, against the linear flow time function. And, uh, and we see that the first and the second events here mark the begin and the end of the linear flow uh, as we identified them uh, from the boarded derivative. And extrapolating this straight line till it intersects uh, the y-axis uh, at linear flow function of zero, uh, give us an estimation of the reservoir pressure of about 6,300 psi, which was very close to the, the expected uh, value. Uh, and uh, we mentioned that pseudo radial flow was identified, so we can use a Horner plot uh, to detect and to, uh, to get a value of the reservoir uh, pressure and permeability. Uh, in this uh, example, the Horner slope or MH was uh, about 7,000 uh, uh, and the intercept of Horner uh, uh, plot uh, or the intercept of the, the bottom hole pressure with a Horner value of one showed uh, a reservoir pressure uh, again of about uh, 6,300, which confirm the, the pseudo linear flow analysis. Uh, and uh, for this defect, we used an average pumping rate of eight barrel per minute and reservoir fluid viscosity of about 0.3 centipoise. And uh, for the reservoir net bay, we used uh, the net bay thickness of uh, 21 feet. Uh, and this result in a permeability uh, from the Horner slope, uh, a permeability of about five uh, milli Darcy. Uh, to confirm the reservoir properties, we use the radial flow time function and we draw a Cartesian plot of the bottom hole pressure against the radial flow time function. Uh, 
and uh, a straight line uh, that was extrapolated till radial flow time function equal zero indicated a reservoir pressure uh, of about 6,350 psi, which also confirms the results from the Horner plot uh, and uh, the permeability using this equation or using the radial flow uh, time function uh, was about 5 milli Darcy. Uh, and this example shows uh, that uh, the linear flow analysis or the linear flow time period can, uh, can be used uh, to give accurate estimation or accurate values of the, of the reservoir pressure in case we didn't reach a pseudo radial flow uh, period. Uh, by this example, we have reached to the end of the session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it was useful. Uh, thank you for listening uh, and I wish to meet you again in more sessions. Uh, and for, uh, for any questions, don't hesitate to contact me anytime. And please uh, send your questions through the mail uh, and I will, stay, uh, I will answer it quickly. Uh, so thank you again for listening. Stay safe and uh, see you soon. Thank you, Andrea Mustafa, for that interesting session. It was one of our uh, very interesting sessions that we conducted in that year. So thank you again for your time and your effort thank uh, you, preparing that material. Uh, also, I would like to thank all the attendees that have their time to attend that session. Uh, just I would like to inform you that if you want to have a certificate for attendance for that webinar, just uh, you can fill into the form that would be sent into the Zoom chat now. Also, I would like to uh, remind you that if you have any question, you can uh, you can send it to uh, Engineer Mustafa email. I would also send it to the uh, Zoom chat now. So uh, thank you again and hope you nice night, ciao.